Imagine living in a cramped space, perhaps a tiny closet, or even better, imagine living in a hollow under the roots of a tree or in a snug snow cave or the hole in the earth the size of a space underneath a desk. Imagine staying there for several months each winter. The space is too small for you to stretch out much or at all. You certainly can't exercise within it. There's no food or water available, so your body has to survive without it. Yet, if you're a bear, holing up in such a space as this is most often your best bet to survive winter. You enter your den in the fall and it remains your home from anywhere from several weeks to several months. And when you emerge in the spring, you're a lot skinnier, but arguably just as healthy as ever. For most bears in North America, this is their world for up to half the year. Bears hibernate to meet winter's challenges, and in doing so, they express some of the most remarkable survival adaptations among mammals. Hi, everyone. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. For bears, hibernation is a time of energy conservation, but it's a lot more than sleep. While hibernating, bears don't eat, they don't drink, they don't urinate, they don't defecate. They maintain their bone health and muscle health without exercise. They heal wounds and broken bones, and female bears even give birth in lactate. During this live chat, we'll explore the amazing world of hibernating bears. We have a lot of content to get to today, but if you do have questions about hibernating bears for me, you can drop those questions in the chat, and I'll do my best to try to answer at least a few of those during the broadcast or at the very end of the broadcast. But to begin, Let's uh, introduce North America's bear species. North America is home to three bear species. And for the purpose of this live chat today, I think it's important to understand some of the distinctions between them. Uh, so let's learn more about their lives and differences. With their great strength, bears rouse feelings of awe and respect. Through their curiosity and intelligence, bears inspire our admiration, and it is always thrilling to see one. Whether it's the adaptable black bear, or the powerful brown bear, or the specialized polar bear, each bear makes a living in its own way. Allow me, Mike Fitz with explore.org, to introduce you to North America's bears. Before the arrival of Europeans, black bears lived in most forested regions of North America, including all states in the contiguous United States, as well as most of Alaska, most of Canada, and much of northern Mexico. Black bear fur is commonly black, but also occurs in shades of brown. More rarely, blue or white color phases occur in isolated populations of black bears living in southeast Alaska and coastal British Columbia. They are the smallest of North America's bears. Reproducing adult females may weigh less than 150 pounds. But just like other bears, they can grow to ample proportions with access to abundant food. The largest black bears on record weighed more than 800 pounds. Although vegetation comprises the bulk of their diet, black bears are highly omnivorous. Perhaps their most defining characteristic, however, is their preference for forests. Even though black bears will travel and often reside in open terrain, no other bear in North America is as closely associated with forests. Their relatively short, sharply curved claws are excellent tools to help them climb trees. Historically, brown bears were found in almost all of Western North America, except for some intermountain desert regions of the United States in small parts of coastal British Columbia. Brown bears are aptly named. Their fur is always a shade of brown and ranges from light blonde to dark brown. Oh, and in case you're wondering, brown and grizzly bears are the same species. Although the names are often used interchangeably, the difference is generally tied to geography. Brown bears typically live in or near coastal regions of North America, while grizzly bears reside farther inland. The name grizzly is homage to the light-tipped or grizzled-colored fur of many individuals of this species. Their sizes vary considerably as well. 
In Yellowstone, large adult males can reach 700 pounds, while the biggest adult males living in coastal Alaska and on Kodiak Island can exceed 1,400 pounds. Brown bears utilize non-forested habitats far more often than black bears. With long front claws and a large hump of muscle at the shoulders, brown bears are also exceptional excavators. Their diet, especially in coastal Alaska and British Columbia, can be heavy with meats like salmon, but brown bears are highly omnivorous, and for most individuals and most populations, plants compose the majority of their diet. Polar bears are the true Arctic bear. They are found throughout ice-covered oceans and seas of the circumpolar Arctic. Along coastal North America, they roam from Newfoundland and Labrador, to Hudson Bay, to the Beaufort Sea, and Chukchi Sea off northern Alaska. Polar bears are well adapted to live on sea ice. Dinner plate-sized paws and ice-hooked shaped claws allow them to grip ice and prey with ease. Their transparent fur lacks pigment. It scatters and reflects visible light to give polar bears exceptional camouflage in their snow and ice-bound habitat. Polar bears rival and often exceed brown bears in size. The biggest adult male polar bears are nearly 10 feet tall when standing on their hind legs. One exceptionally heavy polar bear in Canada reportedly weighed more than 1,700 pounds. Scientists currently estimate that about 900,000 black bears roam North America today. Most black bear populations are growing or stable, but a few isolated populations are categorized as threatened or endangered. They also remain absent from large parts of their former range due to habitat loss and human persecution. Nearly 60,000 brown bears live in North America today, although the great majority of them reside in Northwest Canada and Alaska. Farther south, their range is extremely fragmented. While stable populations of brown bears reside in parts of northern Montana and the Yellowstone region, most other populations in extreme southwest Canada and the contiguous United States are endangered. A few tens of thousands of polar bears are alive in the Arctic, but estimating their abundance is especially difficult since they live in very remote areas and at low densities. The loss of sea ice due to human-driven climate change is the greatest threat to polar bears. Without strong action to reduce carbon emissions and stabilize our climate, all but a few polar bear populations are likely to disappear by the end of the century. We're fortunate to share North America with three of the world's eight bear species. Ensuring a future that includes bears and the opportunity for us to marvel at their adaptations and lifestyles requires a collective effort from all of us to protect bear habitats and expand the tolerance necessary to live alongside the continent's largest predators. I wanted to introduce North America's bears because each species overlaps in some of their behaviors. While they also express significant differences, we see that in regard to hibernation and denning. What hibernation is for bears, where bears hibernate, how they hibernate, why they hibernate, and whether they hibernate at all are questions with nuanced answers. First, let's take a few moments to define hibernation. Bear hibernation is unique, and for that reason, it took scientists a long time to begin to understand its mechanisms or even categorize bears as hibernating animals. Throughout much of the 20th century, many biologists defined mammalian hibernation as a physiological state of reduced metabolism coupled with greatly reduced body temperature. So-called true hibernators were small mammals like ground squirrels that met these narrow parameters. An Arctic ground squirrel, which we sometimes see on the Dumpling Mountain Cam, drops its body temperature to or slightly below the freezing point of water when it hibernates. The ability of bears to survive winter in a dormant state was little understood going into the 1960s and 1970s. Some of the peer-reviewed literature from the time used vocabulary gymnastics to avoid calling bears hibernators, primarily because a bear's body temperature remains elevated during winter. 
Bears were said to enter winter dormancy or winter sleep, winter denning. These phrases hesitantly tied the winter physiology of bears to hibernation, but stopped short of defining it as hibernation. However, many different types of animals survive winter in states of dormancy. It happens in insects, frogs, snakes, lizards, and turtles. It happens in birds, such as the common poor will. It happens in certain lemurs and a species of loris. It happens in bats, hedgehogs, dormice, marmots, and others. So perhaps hibernation is more appropriately defined by its adaptive function and duration rather than by body temperature or a specific physiology. I like to define hibernation as a type of prolonged terpor in which an organism survives in a hypothermic condition for days, weeks, or months, and the condition cannot be easily reversed. As we'll explore, bear hibernation is unique in its own ways, even compared to other mammal hibernators. Why might a bear hibernate though? Bears are quite tolerant of cold weather. At Alaska's Brooks River, bears often sit in sub 50 degree Fahrenheit water for hours at a time while fishing for salmon. In fact, they are prone to overheating when they're active. Importantly, they are so large and powerful that they needn't flee underground to avoid predation. So why do they den at all? Winter is one thing that many bears require for survival, food. If bears are anything, they are hungry. Brown and black bears especially are generalist omnivores, and the breadth of their diet includes hundreds of different types of foods across North America. They are probably the only animals whose diversity in diet rivals people in the ecosystems that we share. Yet living as a large-bodied omnivore has its costs. For brown and black bears, winter brings hardship in the form of famine. The foods they rely upon are unavailable for months. To cope, bears plan ahead. Instinct compels them to work through their active season to sequester body fat. As the source of their wintertime energy, body fat is a savings account against the lean winter months. Bears aren't so much avoiding cold when hibernating as they are enduring famine. But I know some of you are probably thinking, and actually we had an audience question just about this uh, right now or along these lines. Uh, some of you are probably wondering, Mike, you said that hibernation is a strategy to endure wintertime famine. What if you're a bear that has access to food in winter? Do you need to hibernate? Well, no, uh, not at all. Uh, black and brown bears can remain act winter active in areas with relatively mild climates and at least some year-round food. And there are notable examples of winter active bears in several parts of North America. You can find black bears active in winter in Southwest Texas at Big Bend National Park. You can find them in Florida and other parts of the Southeast US active at this time of the year. Uh, in the foothills of the southern Sierra Nevada as well. Near Lake Tahoe, with winters becoming milder and with more human food, food sources available, some black bears are shortening their hibernation, hibernation cycle or foregoing it completely to target foods that people unintentionally or neglectfully provide uh, to bears. And more specifically, there was a question that came in where somebody was wondering before extirpation, it's hard to envision brown bears hibernating along the coast of California especially in regions like the San Francisco Bay Area, where year-round food sources uh, were vast in the 1800s and even before then. Is there anything known about their behavior back then? And uh, I, I don't know specifically, uh, and unfortunately brown bears are extinct in California, so we can't observe their behaviors there today. Uh, but the region was once home to many thousands of, of brown bears. And although I haven't taken the time to investigate the historical record, I think it's quite conceivable that some brown bears would have remained active through the year in parts of California where they would have had, uh, you know, experienced a, a mild climate and found ample food resources, things like acorns, marine mammal carcasses, and fresh herbaceous uh, vegetation. Uh, and non-denning brown bears have even been found in Alaska. In the 1990s, a tracking study on Kodiak Island found at least some male brown bears active all year. Kodiak is uh, located well out in the Pacific Ocean, so it doesn't experience the intense cold of interior Alaska, and its extensive coastline provides bears with year-round foraging opportunities. And then finally, you know, serving as the ultimate example of a winter active ursid are polar bears. 
Polar bears hunt seals on sea ice throughout winter. Only pregnant female polar bears utilize dens. And I'll talk more about the reasons that is a little later on in the broadcast. As these, I think as these examples show, bears do not need to hibernate when they experience the right set of conditions. So denning and hibernation, those are things that are primarily responsible or re, primarily responses uh, to a lack of food. So where do bears hibernate? Answering this question provides another example of their adaptability. They can den nearly anywhere where they feel comfortable and secure. Bears use many different places and shelters as a denning site. Where the soils and geology support it, rock crevices like this one in Yellowstone, as well as boulder fields are popular with bears. In the Arctic, pregnant polar bears frequently dig dens in densely packed wind-driven snowdrifts. You can even see the claw marks at the, in the top of this den from where the, when the bear was digging, thanks to our friends at Polar Bears International for this photo. Trees provide particularly sought after denning habitat. Where there are large trees available, black bears like this one in Glacier National Park often choose dens above the ground in tree cavities. In Pennsylvania, where I grew up, black bears will often den in hollow trees or under trees, sometimes under cabins and porches, and sometimes on the open ground in secluded locations. Our beloved brown bears of Katmai National Park in Alaska construct dens in a Goldilocks zone of conditions. They look for well-drained soils, which help reduce the risk of den flooding. They look for areas where thick vegetation conceals the den entrance and where roots stabilize the den structure. A study from the 1970s found that bear dens in Katmai averaged about 1,300 feet in elevation and were almost always less than 3,000 feet in elevation. A steep hillside and slightly higher elevation increases the probability that the den entrance will be sealed with insulating snow. Because dens in Katmai are carved into fresh earth, they frequently collapse the following summer, forcing bears to excavate new dens each autumn. The bear dens I've seen in Katmai have been barren of any vegetation inside, but people in other areas have documented the floor of bear dens lined with vegetation like spruce boughs or duff from the forest floor. Bears display their adaptability in the variety of den sites that they use. It, but when you think about it, uh, it's one thing to sleep in a tree cavity or a hole. It's another thing to survive within it for several months without eating, drinking, urinating, or defecating. The health of a hibernating bear relies on some of the most remarkable adaptations of any mammal. And their physiological transition from an active lifestyle to one of hibernation begins weeks before a bear enters its den. In a study that I often like to talk about on the bear cams uh, that was from Scandinavia, researchers used tracking collars and surgically implanted heart rate monitors on wild brown bears. And they found that a bear's overall activity, heart rate and body temperature begins to slowly decline up to three weeks before den entry. Heart rate and body temperature declined sharply a few days prior to entering the den. And it continued to drop uh, for three additional weeks after the bear uh, began its hibernation process inside the den. And while they're inside the den, bears are relying on body fat for survival. Metabolizing fat produces metabolic water, heat, and carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is absorbed into the bloodstream and exhaled normally through the lungs, while the heat and water are used for warmth and hydration, respectively. At the ebb of their hibernation cycle, Bears experience a heart rate as low as eight to 10 beats per minute, and they take only two to three breaths per minute. Their body temperatures are maintained relatively high though, about 10 degrees Fahrenheit lower than in summer, even though they experience a metabolic slowdown approaching that of small mammal hibernators. A high body temperature, in fact, is one of the most unique aspects of bear hibernation. In theory, bears could save more energy by suppressing their body temperatures even further, but they don't do that. Although scientists are still unsure why bears maintain such high body temperatures in hibernation, it may have something to do with the ways in which they deal with the difficulties of a lifestyle that forgoes urinating and defecating and lacks exercise. Small mammal hibernators, for instance, will wake up periodically in the wintertime to, to, to urinate. Bears 
although they can wake up, they won't be urinating during that period of time. So for example, hibernation is an effective strategy to endure, to endure food scarcity, but it introduces a new problem for bears. All of a sudden you lack dietary protein while you accumulate bodily waste. And for a moment, consider the hardships that people experience when we are bedridden and the negative consequences that has on our physical health. Consider how our bodies can't cope with bodily waste if we stop urinating or defecating. Bears have adapted ways to overcome those challenges. And it's fascinating how they do that. By fasting, uh, the hibernating bear really deprives itself of dietary protein. And by not exercising or even moving much at all, the bear also deprives itself of the stimuli that keep muscles strong. Their inactivity and starvation diet should lead to severe muscle loss, but this does not happen. They not only preserve muscle mass and muscle performance while they're hibernating, they also don't poison their bodies with their own metabolic waste. Although healthy bears rely almost entirely on body fat for energy when hibernating, they still utilize some lean tissue. Burning muscle creates urea, which the kidneys filter out of the bloodstream. And now normally urea is flushed from the body by urinating. Hibernating bears, however, have greatly reduced kidney function. And as I've mentioned, they don't urinate. So how do they avoid poisoning themselves, themselves with their own bodily waste? Hibernating mammals such as bears seem to have the ability to recycle the nitrogen that is present in their, re their urea using the help of gut microbes. Certain microbes have an enzyme called urease that can break down urea into its component parts and free its nitrogen molecules. And this is an ability that mammals lack on their own. Uh, the process in microbes is called urea nitrogen salvage. And it's been known for a long time to occur in ruminant animals. They, you know, species like cows, for example. In ground squirrels, it's also been documented as well. Hibernating ground squirrels uh, use the process uh, to reabsorb nitrogen um, through their intestines, and they can use that to help maintain their muscle mass and function. This process hasn't, as far as I know, been explicitly documented in bears, but we do know that bears recycle their urea into usable protein. So the gut microbiome likely plays a significant role in a hibernating bear's health. And similar to muscles, bones also need to experience force through exercise to remain strong. Captive hibernating bears are, uh, in, one, in one study, uh, that are in my, that's in my files, uh, some researchers found that the captive hibernating bears that they were looking at remained inactive for over 98% of their hibernation period. So again, that can last anywhere from just a few weeks, depending on where they are in North America, to, to up to six months. If, if bears were like people, they would, they would experience significant bone loss during hibernation. Again, that doesn't happen. Their ability to preserve bone density may be influenced by hormones or different expressions of genes or other mechanisms that we don't yet understand. Scientists continue to explore this phenomenal aspect of their biology. Bears possess the ability while hibernating to heal wounds and broken bones during hibernation. In people, blood flow, high body temperature, and kidney function are all important factors in wound healing, yet all are reduced in hibernating bears. So how bears are able, again, to heal wounds and, and broken bones while they're hibernating and not eating or drinking, and while they're slightly hypothermic, how that happens is again, not well understood. So much of what bears cope with during hibernation is amazing. Yet mother bears do all that and they give birth. Of all the feats that bears accomplish during hibernation, perhaps this is the most remarkable. In the depths of winter, mother brown bears give birth to especially tiny babies. Newborn bear cubs are born about the size and weight of a can of soup. It may be difficult to envision the mighty brown bear as such a small and vulnerable creature, but they all start life this way. Hey everyone, this is Mike Fitz with explore.org. Let's take a few moments to explore the birth of a brown bear, an event that reveals the finely tuned adaptations that allow bear families to survive winter in safety and good health. Brown bears are born in late January and early February. At birth, cubs weigh about one pound and measure only eight to nine inches long. They are lightly furred 
Their ears are closed, and their short muzzles contain toothless mouths. Their bodies at this time are so underdeveloped that they can't maintain their own body temperature. To stay warm, cubs must remain in near constant contact with mother for the first two to three weeks of life. Without mother's care and attention, newborn cubs are exceptionally vulnerable to hypothermia, dehydration, and starvation. Yet their small birth size is entirely purposeful. It allows the mother bear to sustain the development and growth of her cubs at a time of year when her body remains in a state of hibernation. Hibernation poses some unique metabolic and physiologic challenges for a mother bear. When hibernating, she does not have access to food or water, nor does she urinate or defecate. With hibernation lasting several months, her body must house all the energy necessary to sustain her survival as well as that of her expectant cubs. How does she do it? Body fat fuels a bear's wintertime survival. It provides the energy to keep a bear warm and the metabolic water necessary to keep it hydrated. Bears get really fat before hibernating, but the growth of a mammal fetus, including a fetal bear, is largely sustained with sugar and protein. Because a mother bear hibernates while she gestates her cubs, she lacks a surplus of body protein and sugar to feed cubs growing in the womb. Fetuses also produce bodily waste, which are transferred to mother through the umbilical cord and add to the physiological difficulties of her hibernation cycle. To overcome these challenges, a mother bear gestates her cubs for a short time, only six to eight weeks. After they are born, cubs feed and grow on milk, which is an energy source that mother can produce in abundance from her ample body fat. The switch from feeding cubs in the womb through the placenta to milk sourced from body fat allows the mother bear to preserve her lean tissue and sugar while she supports the continued growth of her cubs. Milk is the perfect food for young bear cubs and they grow rapidly on it. Cubs often weigh five pounds at one month old and by the time they emerge from the den in mid to late spring, they can weigh 15 pounds or more. Near the end of January, or in early February, take a moment to wish your favorite bear a happy birthday. The midwinter birth of a brown bear is timed perfectly. Cubs are born purposefully premature inside a den that serves as a surrogate womb. It is an ideal setting for cubs to grow and mature in safety and comfort. And as we've discussed, bears are not obligate hibernators. It's not like their need to breathe air. Given the right combination of conditions, bears can survive winter quite well without denning or hibernating. However, the small size of cubs at birth ties mother bears to a period of activity no matter where in North America they happen to live. And this is the sole reason why mother polar bears utilize dens. All other polar bears remain active in winter, including those with year-old cubs. But since polar bears use the same reproductive strategy as their brown bear ancestors, pregnant female polar bears remain constrained by the small birth size of their cubs. For polar bears, dens are necessary as birthing layers where cubs can grow safely for the first few weeks of their lives. Although many of the processes that occur during bear hibernation remain scientific mysteries, we're gaining new insights each year. The study of bear genetics is proving to be particularly interesting. Last summer, Ranger Naomi Boak spoke with Dr. Michael Saxton about his PhD work, including this interesting facet of the genetic differences experienced by a bear when it hibernates. So uh, another thing that um, happens here is that we know very little about where bears den um, what happens in their hibernation period. I mean, we know from studies that have been done in other places about the physiology of hibernation and all. So what, what did you learn? What are the highlights of what you learned in the hibernation part of your study? Okay, well, the biggest highlight is, holy cow, there's a lot of change between hibernation and active season. Um, so when we looked just at the tissue that came directly from the bears, um, it was about 6,000 genes that were what we call differentially expressed. So there's changes in the expression of the gene between the two different seasons. Wow. 
So just to give you some context, there's about the humans, bears, we have about 32,000 known genes that are expressed somewhat regularly throughout the body, not necessarily in every tissue. Each tissue has different genes that are expressed. Um, Can you just um, talk a little bit about expression of genes? Because a lot of people don't yeah, know oh, what yes. gene expression Thank you. is. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so so the, the central dogma of molecular biology, you've got <laughs> DNA that gets turned into RNA and that gets turned into proteins and proteins are what, you know, make us look like and act like who we are. Um, so that process of going from DNA to RNA is what we're talking about. That's the expression portion. Um, that's that when I talk about expression, I'm talking about the expression of the RNA. Um, and yeah, so it's, we got like 6,000 genes that are differentially expressed and that's on par with the differential expression between humans and chimps. So the two totally different species right. are having the same, same level of differential expression that we've got within a single individual in different seasons. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is when I'm comparing one individual to itself in a different season. So, so what, what might that be in terms, you know, what would um, that difference in genetic expression mean in terms of the bear's biology? It means a lot of things. Um, we we do suspect that overall expression is being shut down uh, in, in hibernation, which makes sense. It takes energy to, to make that RNA. And of course they're trying to conserve energy. Um, so there's an overall reduction in expression of RNA. Um, but these ones that are differentially expressed means that they are either, it's outside of what would be expected. So outside of that expected downturn, either there is, are some that are turned way up or some that are turned way down. Now I'll say when you get 6,000 of them, it's tough to then go and look at every single one of them and oh, know, come know everything on, is Michael, happening. Come I know, on. I know, I apologize. Um, primarily, what I was interested in is the uh, what's it's the insulin signaling pathway. Ah, um, so very interesting and very interesting for humans, yes, right? Yeah. So bears in hibernation essentially become type two diabetics, uh, and they will no longer respond to to insulin. Um, and so we were trying to figure out kind of what is going on, what changes are occurring there that might account for that. Um, we found several genes that were great candidates. And then, as I mentioned for chapter two, we did this cell culture thing where we took some of the adipose cells or fat cells, grew them in the, in the lab, and then did the same sort of thing. And intriguingly found, um, very different genes that were differentially expressed between hmm. these, these ones in cell culture. There were a couple of genes that, that are uh, of interest that we're going to keep looking at, um, that might uh, where the pathways essentially like shutdowns of certain pathways may be, may be triggering this. So there, so are you saying that there were environmental factors that, that absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll get, um, I mean, you'll get differences in the expression of your RNA based on what you have for breakfast that morning. Right. Um, so, uh, one thing that we did was we compared across multiple years also to make sure that, uh, there is a relatively similar expression pattern that's showing up. And we did find that. So even when, you know, we had one year that was pretty warm winter, one year that was pretty cold winter. Um, so then we, you know, we took out the genes that, that were differentially expressed as a result of that sort of thing. Um, so we're trying to isolate just the genes that are, you know, consistently changed in bears so that we can try and figure out where in this pathway, um, uh, there, you know, this, this, uh, this, this fascinating phenomenon occurs. Um, there's also always, you know, this is my PhD as part of a larger research project. Um, and so you know, my advisors now are going to continue on and we're looking at things like, all right, well, I looked at RNA. Now somebody else needs to look at, look at protein. Maybe it has nothing to do with the changes in RNA. Maybe it's all about the changes in proteins. Wow. Uh, <laughs> or maybe it's some other part of the, you know, there's all sorts of things that it could be. So the study of bear genetics, I think, can open up a whole new world of our understanding of how they survive hibernation. And if you want to learn more about uh, Ranger Michael Saxton's research, um, you, and you could watch the whole conversation between him and Ranger Naomi on Explored Org's Bears and Bison YouTube channel. I want to get to a few audience questions in uh, just a few moments. Before I do, however, however I, I have a uh, some final thoughts to share. The, the study of bear hibernation, hibernation is, is promising and exciting, uh, especially, you know, from my perspective, who I'm sort of a bear junkie and I love to learn more about brown bears and, and watch them. Uh, and it, the study of, you know, their lives and their hibernation processes 
help to satisfy our innate curiosity about how the world works. And importantly, it may lead us to discover novel treatments for many diseases and conditions that plague humanity. The study of bear hibernation may teach us how to advance and maintain the health of people. Uh, for example, in the den, ex bears experience the equivalent of, of months of bed rest, yet they retain an ability to get up and walk throughout hibernation and apparently experience no issues resuming an active lifestyle once they leave the den in the spring. A person couldn't do that. Uh, like muscles, bone health depends on a good diet and plenty of exercise. And in humans, prolonged immobilization and rest promote significant bone loss. And afterward, our skeleton can take years to recover. Yet hibernating bears maintain their bone health without the normally required physical stimulus. Again, that's something a person couldn't do. We might expect that a bear, hibernating bear's wounds would not heal easily, or perhaps not at all, but that's not the case either. They heal wounds and broken bones despite limited blood flow, despite below normal body temperatures, despite having limited kidney function. Kidneys are almost shut down under, yet they resume normal function after the bears exit the den in the spring. A hibernating bear's heart pumps so little blood that a person with the same condition would die. Bears have also have very high levels of cholesterol in their blood, but they don't experience hardening, hardening of the arteries or heart disease as we know it. You heard um, uh, Ranger Michael talking about uh, how bears are resistant to insulin in hibernation, yet this process reverses in spring. How are they doing that? And could that, uh, that trick be applied to help people? Since bears hibernate with relatively high body temperatures, their survival adaptations may operate at human body temperatures. If we can unlock the secrets of bear hibernation, then perhaps we can find ways to treat chronic and frustrating diseases, things like heart disease, kidney disease, and diabetes. We might be able to provide better care and promote faster recovery for people who experience trauma, stroke, or heart attack. Lowering a person's metabolic rate following a stroke, for example, would slow the rate of tissue damage and afford doctors more time to provide treatment. We might be able to keep muscle and bone strong when we are immobilized for long periods of time or to mitigate the effects of sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle tissue as a natural part of aging. During space flight, you know, if we, wanted, we want to think big too, uh, crew members lose muscle and bone mass due to the effects of microgravity, even though astronauts exercise vigorously while in space. Hibernating bears don't need exercise to maintain their overall fitness. So the secrets of bear hibernation might also help us explore the solar system. And it wasn't long ago that no one understood the potential applications of bear hibernation on human health. So as a final thought, I wonder if, if bears lead us to discover effective treatments for osteoporosis, if they help us survive and heal after trauma, if they help us explore the solar system on crewed missions, what might we have lost if they had gone extinct at our hands. Bears, like other wild animals, of course, have the, the right to exist, a right that transcends the real or perceived or uh, benefits that they give humans. Bears hibernate to meet winter's challenges and benefit their own survival rather than our own. However, when we consider the extinction crisis that we're causing through habitat loss and mass consumption and climate change, I also wonder what we are depriving ourselves and future generations by not doing more to protect our planet's biodiversity. As the process of bear hibernation demonstrates, nature may already have solutions to some of our most vexing health issues. We only need to protect and investigate nature so that nature can show us the way. And finally, uh, consider that even compared to other mammal hibernators, bears are metabolic magicians. Although a person placed in the same situation would not survive, bears emerge from hibernation fit and ready for their active season. In doing so, they express some of the most remarkable adaptations among mammals. And I think they will be endlessly fascinating for those reasons. We do have several questions in our queue here that I didn't get to during the conversation. Thanks for everyone's patience and waiting for me to answer those if you submitted them in advance. I'll try to get to a few of those at least before I call it um, before I call it an evening here. So let's see what you had submitted here. 
Somebody was um, wondering again about bears exiting the den. And uh, this person writes, when a bear leaves the den and is kind of weak for like three weeks or so, uh, would it be interesting in some really, would it be interested in some really fragrant gourmet food it comes across, like a carcass? Or would we just say, uh, no, not now? I, th I think it might depend on the bear. Again, um, there's, a, there's a wide range of differences in the behavior of individual bears across uh, North America. But as a general sort of like rule of thumb on the behavior of bears, immediately after they sort of like emerge from their dens, they're not very high, hungry during that time. Uh, so they, uh, in studies, I know there's at least one study that I read on captive hibernating bears that found that, um, that they might sort of ignore food uh, immediately after sort of like waking up from their hibernation cycle. Uh, it, it takes their bodies a, um, a, a bit of time to really kind of ramp up back to an active metabolism. So at the beginning of our conversation today, I mentioned how when they're going into hibernation, it's like a really long, slow, drawn out process. And to wake up from hibernation, that same thing sort of happens. So it's a long, drawn out process. Their heart rate and things like that don't stabilize for a few weeks after they exit the den. So it's possible that a bear could ignore a food source if it wasn't quite ready for it yet. But if a bear also came out of the den quite skinny, maybe it was um, you know, starting to metabolize some of its muscle tissue because it ran out of fat, for example, I can't imagine that it would pass up a really gourmet meal like, like a winter killed moose or something like that. Weather does influence um, the it does, yeah, it does. It does influence um, the behavior of, of bears and when they might want to den, for instance. And the next question is sort of based on that. Uh, this person writes, uh, based on what the weather was like this past winter, can you give us a guess as to when our Katmai bears begin to leave their dens uh, and head to Brooks Camp? Well, uh, it's it's hard to say. I think it might really just depend on not necessarily what's happening in in the deep winter like right now, but what happens in the springtime? If there are um, a lot of warm temperatures in the spring um, and earlier than average thaw, for instance, then bears might wake up earlier. There is some, some decent evidence that um, the timing of den entry and den exit is correlated with weather. So if the weather turns colder in the fall, bears might go into their dens earlier. Um, if the weather is cold in the springtime, they may stay in their dens just a little bit longer. And that kind of makes sense on the beginning side of things and on the ending uh, side of things. Uh, you know, the, 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 the amount of food that's available for a bear, like in the Katmai region of Alaska, really just plummets when things start to get cold, when things start to freeze. So it would make sense for a bear to go into den right around the time of, of freeze up. Uh, but waking up and coming out of your den, that's a whole different process. So bears are um, not necessarily always triggered or not exclusively triggered to exit the den based on weather. There has to be some other sort of um, internal rhythms that allow them to continue um, to, to wake up long before they exit the den, because that, again, that's a weeks long process. So it's not just necessarily something where all of a sudden they feel like a, a warm spring day and they're like, hey, we're ready to go. Uh, there's some other sort of internal hormonal process that's helping to jumpstart um, that, that, that process overall. Uh, somebody was wondering about um, bears' low metabolism, and um, and with that extremely low metabolism, how can they begin to uh, to be safely anesthetized when they are checked by biologists um, and being removed from their den uh, to be examined? And you know, I again, I'm not I'm not sure because um, I've never had the opportunity to be part of that process. It's a um, it's maybe it's, this is something that I'd have to investigate more, but I think it's because, um, you know, a bear when it's hibernating, you know, still retains the ability to, to, um, to get up, move around. So, um, the tranquilizing, uh, drugs or agents that biologists will use are for, for bears in the winter are essentially the same as they are in the summer. And there doesn't seem to be really any significant differences in how that, that impacts um, the bear. And in fact, in the wintertime, it may be even less if the, if the biologist can sneak up on the bear and, and they can sort of jab it. it, it from what I've um, you know, read and um, some of the video footage that I've seen, it seems to be quite a, uh, sometimes a risky endeavor because you gotta 
sometimes they have to go into the den um, to do to do that process. So I think biologists try to avoid it as much as they can. But uh, but the but the tranquilizing drugs that that um, biologists use these days on bears have a really wide margin of error, which is which is good for the bear. It's good for people, um, and also. Um, it, it seems to have the same effects on uh, on a wintertime bear versus a, a summertime bear. And there was a question actually uh, towards the beginning uh, that was submitted fairly early in our conversation about uh, about hibernating ground squirrels, for instance. I mentioned that um, ground squirrels, like Arctic ground squirrels, will uh, allow their body temperatures to to lower to basically at the freezing point of water. And sometimes they'll hibernate with body temperatures below the freezing point of water. Really kind of remarkable. And somebody's wondering about how that happens. Uh, so do the rodents blood literally crystallize and then thaw? It doesn't seem like their blood is, is actually crystallizing um, and, and forming necessarily ice crystals. From what I can remember, it has to do with their, their blood and their tissues uh, being able to super cool. So the chemistry of their bodily tissues and the, um, the intercellular um, fluid, uh, you know, has um, basically an antifreeze in it, or they develop an antifreeze at that time. So they're, um, so they're not really experiencing frostbite um, when they wake up. It's just kind of, they wake up normally, uh, their a healthy ground squirrel will have the, uh, uh, the ability to move around um, once, it's, once it's fully awake like a, a hibernating bear. But it, it takes a lot of energy for them to do that because they are um, hibernating at such a low body temperature. And they'll wake up several times during the winter. So it, um, to, to shiver back up to a normal body temperature, to do something like urinate or actually go to sleep, um, sometimes sometime scientists uh, actually hypothesize that one reason why ground squirrels will wake up periodically into, in the winter is to actually sleep because maybe they just can't have normal brain function um, when they're in their deep hibernator phase. Uh, so, so it takes a, just a tremendous amount of energy uh, for that to happen. But it's not like their blood is actually freezing. It's more like their body tissues can super cool and just avoid freezing uh, all altogether. So, yeah, it's a fascinating process. And there's a, a lot of really great work on ground. Read more about that. Uh, another question that came fairly early in our um, in our conversation today. Uh, do bears ever share the same den in different years? Uh, yes and no. Depends on where bears are, um, what uh, habitat they're they're uh, they're living in. So if if it's a if it's an area where um, a den that they had used previously previously um, sort of has a stable structure to it. Again, think of a hollow tree, for instance, or um, a rock crevice. Then a bear might visit that same space over and over again over multiple years. Uh, or it could be used by different bears over multiple years. In the Katmai region, though, bears are going to dig new dens each year because the geology, the soils, uh, the trees, they just don't support um, you know, permanent den structures like that. Uh, it, Adult bears are going to den alone unless a mother bear is denning with her cubs, for instance. In extremely rare cases, there's a, there's a slight possibility that uh, some young sibling bears might spend a whole summer together and then go into the den. But that's that's extremely rare. I don't want people to think that that is a sort of a normal thing. It doesn't seem like it's it's um, documented um, much in the uh, scientific literature. Just a few more questions that'll get here. Uh, before we uh, call it an evening. Um, somebody was wondering, have there been uh, studies that examine whether there are physiological or hormonal differences between new mother bears and other hibernating bears? And if yes, what have they found? I, I Again, this is something that I, I'm not sure about. I'd have to go and refresh my memory um, looking at the studies that I, ha that I have on file. There must be differences though. Um, I can remember just off the top of my head that um, mother brown bears might have a, a slightly higher body temperature than other hibernating um, brown bears, at least mother brown bears that are giving birth. Um, that wouldn't necessarily apply to mother bear, bears with older cubs that are in the same den. Um, and that might have just something to do with the gestation process, making sure that her cubs um, are gestating properly and developing properly in the womb, and also that um, they have enough warmth to stay warm after they are born. So I know that there are at least differences in temperature. There must be other physiological and hormonal differences 
that conversation between um, Rangers, uh, Naomi and Michael that we had a clip for earlier, one of the um, questions that Michael uh, was asked during that chat was actually about whether anyone had looked at the genetic differences between um, you know, a pregnant female uh, bear and just a, any other bear. And no one had up to that point, uh, at least in, in the conversation that he had known about. So that's, that's an area ripe for research, I believe. And is research uh, being done actively? Is funding, for example, has funding been allocated for this on the implications of bear hibernation to various human conditions? And certainly, yes, um, there are many researchers that are looking at that um, for a variety of reasons. All of those things that we um, talked about towards the conclusion of the broadcast, how, how bears become diabetic, but then they reverse, how they can maintain their bone and muscle health. Um, and the uh, university, uh, or excuse me, Washington State University, where Michael Staxton did his PhD work, uh, PhD work, that's a spot that has a lot of that, that active research going on. And I know there's other um, facilities and research institutions in North America looking at similar, answering similar questions and in lines of, of research. And do bears um, have a, a clean out of their GI tract upon leaving the den? Well, they're not, you know, of course they're not eating a lot of things, but even a starving person will produce, you know, some feces. So that happens in bears as well. Uh, it seems like over the course of the winter time, from what I've read, uh, bears will develop sort of like a fecal plug, for instance, and then they'll expel that once they leave the den sometime after. I've never found one when I've been roaming, you know, like springtime areas, you know, near my home here in Maine, um, hoping to, you know, stumble upon an area where a bear had denned um, in the spring or even in Katmai National Park. I've never seen anything like that, but that's uh, been reported um, to happen. And then let's see here. Um, there was one question about emancipated siblings sharing a den. So hopefully I got to that question and answered that well enough. I'll try to get to um, just one more question here um, because this is a, sort of an important one. And um, it's about uh, what can people do to coexist peacefully with bears in areas where there are bear populations? You know, that's a, that's a challenging thing. Um, there, when, when we try to share um, bear habitat with um, you're, with, you're, we try to share habitat with bears, I should say. There's the, always the possibility of a conflict, conflict over space or conflict over food resources. And I always try to remember, no matter where I happen to go, if it's good habitat for people in North America, it's likely also good habitat for bears. You can think about, especially the Intermountain, Intermountain West of the United States. Um, in the Rocky Mountain region and the Great Plains region, the places where we have our, um, there are our largest settlements and cities and, and towns and villages, those would have been the places that where bears wanted to be in certain seasons, especially like in springtime or in summer, where they could find a lot of foraging. Um, in California, for instance, too, along the coast, where a lot of people like to live, that probably was remarkable habitat for bears in the past. So bears are expanding their range in a lot of areas. They're expanding their range into suburban areas. I know like in the Northeast United States, that's happening. New Jersey is a hotbed for human bear conflict right now, for instance. Um, in, in the, uh, uh, you know, the Yellowstone and Northern Continental Divide ecosystem of Montana, grizzly bears are expanding their range even out into the prairies once again. So to coexist with bears, I think we have to think about what the needs of bears are and try to ensure that they're meeting their needs in the wild without um, trying to focus on our um, homes and our habitation sites, our farms, for instance, as a place um, to find food and look for us um, as a source of food, um, whether that's like grain, for instance, or livestock or garbage, especially. So if you're in bear habitat, you want to share, um, you know, your habitat with bears. Um, the best thing to do, in my opinion, is to make sure that you're removing attractants from the near vicinity of your home as best as you can. So if that means um, taking your bird feeders down in the springtime, do it. If that means making sure that you put your garbage out in the morning um, before, right before the garbage truck comes instead of overnight, uh, do, th do that. Uh, there's a lot of small steps that we can all take to make sure that bears have the opportunity to live as wild animals and that, um, and that we're, we're reducing the risk to, um, to bears and, and ourselves. There's um, a couple of really good um, 
you know, organizations that try to help people coexist with bears. One of that I can think of off the top of my head is um, is Bear Smart, and you can find just type in Bear Smart. Um, I forget the exact website, but go there. They have a lot of great um, instances or a lot of great information on how people and bears can can live together. Uh, and it's been fun talking with everybody this evening. Thanks for everyone's questions. Um, I, I tried to answer as many as I could. My voice is getting a little hoarse from so much of the speaking that I did over the last hour or so. Um, but BearCam will be back here on Explore.org coming up in June. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, think about the bears and how they are adapted to living throughout winter without food or water. Really remarkable process. And I'll, I'll be talking to you soon with more live chats here on Explore.org. My name is Mike Fitz. Have a great night. And as we like to say here at Explore, never stop learning.